Hi, everyone. Pastor Galen, lead pastor at Shine Hills Church. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope that these podcasts will be a real encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. You can also connect with Cheyenne Hills at CheyenneHills.org. Hope you enjoy the program. Across the street and around the world, Cheyenne Hills. Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. And Nathan, welcome back to the studio. Good to be here. You've been halfway around the world and back. So <laughs> what it feels like. I walked just across the lobby here as we were talking, and it's like you've been in about, I don't know, five places. One of the places you went to, what we got to talk about is... To visit David Barton, and is it in Dallas? In, in uh, yeah, just outside of Dallas, wow. near so Fort I, Worth. I yeah. got to hear all that story. Yeah, yeah. But we we've, we've also got to hit a little bit on what's going on in the Supreme Court today. Big news. Big news. Big and, news. And now, the way I understand it, we won't know what they decided on Roe v. Wade, or at least in this particular uh, case, for three or four months. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Today's just the, the, the hearing, the Supreme okay. Court hearing. But normally what they'll do is they'll release a lot of this information around March. So, But this is a big day. Yeah. 48 years ago, 1973, is when Roe v. Wade was decided. Okay. And all these years later, uh, we finally are starting to see some sort of uh, action. This is Many people are talking about this is the strongest uh, possibility of right. seeing that overturned this ever been seen. So I've, I've heard that by several people that I, or that I listen to as well. And yeah. can, can you kind of, un, would you mind just unpacking that a little bit? What, what makes this unique? What's the unique angle that's being taken yeah. here before the Supreme Court? Well, Mississippi, this, this stems from a case uh, in Mississippi and it's called, uh, it's the Dobbs case. And when you look at what happened in that Dobbs case, Mississippi had chosen to begin to constrict uh, abortion in certain ways that were very important, uh, and and people began to the, the abortion industry began to rebel against that and say, "Listen, the the state of Mississippi is infringing on our, as they phrased it, constitutional right to give abortions." Okay. And so Mississippi, of course, was able to challenge that successfully all the way through their court system, which then uh, it was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court because it falls directly under Roe versus Wade. Right. And uh, all indications uh, show right now that this is um, a well-done case uh, on behalf of Mississippi. And so there are a lot of people looking at this and saying, no, that basically we need to go back and understand what is the role of a state. That's and what did I keep... Roe versus Wade step out of its jurisdiction? Right. And so that that's a constitutional... That is. That's the constitutional debate, right? Whether or not this can be should be decided on the state level right. versus the national level. Yes, that's right. Okay, there's another part of this that's a, is a big deal about the 15 weeks. I think Georgia, remember, they, they passed right. something. Right, heartbeat bill. The, okay, so can you under, explain why? Because when I tuned in today and I was listening to it, that was a big part of the debate of this this 15 weeks, and, and they just were camping on that for a while. So... Can you unpack that? I'm throwing right. this at you fresh now, but well, yeah, sure. Well, there's a big word that they they throw around called previability. Yep, and that is when is a life sustainable in the womb? Okay. And so part of what has been challenged is the question as to whether is a life sustainable in the womb uh, when when you can detect a heartbeat, which okay. is a right around from what I understand, and I'm not a professional on this, but it's right around the 15 week mark. Okay. And so that's been the question under undergirding uh, the the heartbeat bill, and so that was first passed in Georgia, and right. that that Georgia bill was um, they they tried to attack that there and lost, and then Mississippi passed something, uh, okay. and and they've tried to attack it in Mississippi. Thankfully, Mississippi incorporated that uh, in the decision from their Supreme Court. Said uh, they basically wrote the U.S. Supreme Court needs to look at this. Okay, when they say this, are you are they talking about the the heartbeat part of it, the fifteen weeks? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the, that's the why question of is, viability. That's yeah. how it got it got implant, implanted into the implemented into the uh, Mississippi bill, right? That's right. Oh, gotcha. Right. Okay, that's why it's such a big deal. Right. They they camped on that. I I probably you know drove for fifteen minutes doing some yeah. errands, and that was the the topic that was right. being discussed. So, well, part of what what it is is. Um, the abortion lobby, the abortion industry, is um, saying that what it does is it imposes an undue burden. That really, to try to prove a heartbeat, uh, um, 
restricts the ability to, to for them to commit abortions um, too much. And they talk about an undue burden. And so what they began to do is actually a group called the Jackson Women Health Women's Health Organization that began to protest against this and actually is the one that pursued this legal action. Okay. But thankfully, I think what we're going to see is that when people get a good look at this, what they're asking for, what the ab abortion industry has been asking for um, all along is something that the vast majority of Americans today disagree with. Yeah. And so when we talk about abortion... Meaning in, abortion after the 15 or the 21 right. weeks is that, exactly. what you're saying? Yes, yeah. I, I agree with you. Those yeah. numbers are actually growing uh, as millennials are yeah. joining the, the, uh, the voting uh, uh, background in America. One thing that we can see is that most people can recognize, for instance, that late-term abortions are wrong. Yeah. You're literally murdering a child in the womb. Because that, that is yeah. a viable life that can live right. outside of that womb. We know after 19 weeks, that's mm -hmm. a, I don't know if it's automatic, but 19, 20, 21 weeks, those, those babies, because right. of our science and right, right. And the, exactly. The NICU uh, type of expertise that our doctors and nurses have right. figured out, they can keep this baby alive mm -hmm. in a, 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 basically until they mature. And then, and then there's no, no difference as far as mental development, physical development. Right. It's amazing to me. You know, Galen, you know, I've had people ask me this, but this was an early question. Why does the church care so much about this issue? Great question. Yeah. Yeah. So in, and for me, I, I could, I guess I, I could give my own reasons why, but uh, I'd love to ask, pose that to you first yeah. as, as a theologian. Yeah. Um, this is something that the, the the Christian community has really picked up to to expose to the world. Listen, this is well, anus. This is this really crime. important, I think, because I think a lot of times, and I, this is kind of how I approach all things, uh, spiritual, biblical. The there's this there's a verse in in scripture, and I'm going to look it up here in a second. Is the the idea of the natural man cannot understand spiritual things. Oh yeah. Yes. It's in First Corinthians. I, mm -hmm. I've I've turned to it. I'm gonna going to find it real quick. First Corinthians, it's chapter two, verse fourteen. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, the natural this one says the natural person. The natural person does not accept things of the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. for they are folly to him. Or another version says they're foolishness to foolishness. him. Foolish. All right. 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 And he is not able to understand them because he they are spiritually discerned. So the only way that I as a Christian can know or understand or believe that life begins at conception mm -hmm. is because I've got some verses in scripture right. that indicate that I, you know, I was knit together in my mother's room. I was fearfully, wonderfully made. There's another verse that talks about, I knew you before you were born in Jeremiah. Right. Exactly. And so this whole idea is like, okay, so God is the one that's saying that this, it's not, it's not my understanding is so grand. It's not that at all. It's like, this is what the Bible says. Right. Now, hold that thought, because I, I want to come back to that. But the way that I get there, this is the thing I think all Christians need to understand. The, the, food, the natural mind that doesn't have life in Christ is, this is foolishness to them. That's what the right. Bible says. Yeah, yeah. Not only this, but there's other issues that right. in our day, mm -hmm. right? And we go, well, how, how can you believe this or that? It's like, well, it, yeah. go ahead. That word foolishness, by the way, there in Greek, that's the word moria, from moron, which we also yes. get moron. moron yeah, no. And you think about it, it, it literally is though, is talking about it, that there are things that you and I would care about, that a Christian would care about, that is an absurdity right. to others in a couple different ways. If I could dissect that sure. for just a second, one would be, uh, why would we care so much? Or another is, why would we care at all? Yep. And so when we talk about how, and by the way, this happens a lot in politics, Two people sit at a table, and it's like I have one professor that one time talked about the, uh, a fight between a well and an elephant. You know, <laughs> they can both thrash around and stomp in their own domains and never once lay a finger on each other. No kidding. That's a good And a lot of times you'll find people yeah. on two sides of a thing, and it's, it's like a whale and an elephant fighting. There's right. a lot of froth and a lot of foaming and everything else, but nothing ever happens. And it's right. partly because we, it's almost impossible for us to recognize one another because Boy, that's we really see each good. other as speaking absurdities. To totally different uh, views. And and so the, the point is, how do I come to that knowledge? It's like, well, I didn't come to the knowledge of that life began at conception, um, you know, 
going to Sunday school. I came to faith in Christ. Mm-hmm. When I came to faith in Christ, I realized Christ changed my life. Amen. And and what he says about this idea of regeneration, mm-hmm. that they are, are the scales fall from our eyes, that I'm spiritually discerned. You know, the Spirit of God is now in us, not just with us, He's in us. Mm-hmm. We start seeing these things, see things differently. Right, right. But I know that my life has changed. I know that God did things in my life that I could not done, I could not have done myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so because of that, I know this the Bible's true. So when I start reading this now with the lens of this is truth mm-hmm. and the Spirit of God's in me to help me to understand this truth, right. which is a those are key, key components. And I think sometimes we in the church or Christians, we forget that that's the only reason I can understand the, the Trinity. Mm-hmm. No one can explain it. I mean, we can explain it, but no one fully understands it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, the greatest minds have tried to figure out the, what does that mean exactly? I don't know, but it's the, you know, God, the father's God, God, the son's God, God, the spirit's God. They're all God. They're all different persons. One essence. I mean, we have these little examples of, right. You know, uh, water is in three forms: uh, water and gas, and and liquid gas and and solid, mm-hmm. and that's the best we have. But it's all H two O. That's not bad. Mm-hmm. So we can explain it, but do I understand it? Not even a chance. Right. But do I believe it? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. How do I defend it? It's like, well, it's because Christ has changed my life, and He's given me the ability to see this. Right. To the natural man, this is foolishness. Mm-hmm. Okay, so whether it's life begins at conception, to them, that's like. Well, that's foolishness. There's no way that's a viable. So, but here's what I think. So this whole idea of heartbeat you're talking about at, at uh, 15 weeks or 20 weeks or 21, wherever that is, that we know we can keep that baby alive outside of the womb, right? I don't, this is the part for me. It's like natural man should be able to see that. You're right. Right? Right. And so why are we even debating if if science can back this up to whatever, 15 weeks or whatever the time is that we can keep a baby alive outside. Mm-hmm. That should be a no brainer. Right. That is nat- natural. Man can see that you don't have to have spiritual eyes to see. Yep. That baby can live outside of the womb. Right. Now, the reason I believe that life is a, is a viable life from conception is because scripture tells me that. there we go. It's yes. Not, it's not You're because right. I'm this, right. I don't know, intelligent, great mind. It's like, no, I just, I, this is what I believe the Bible says. Right. Now, at the end of the day, we come to these things of scripture and it's because not because we're trying to force our views. This is just me. I'm not trying to force my views on anybody. I want to try to convince them that Jesus loves them and they, you know, he died for their sin. That's my, my role. But when it comes to the, these, uh, uh, issues of our day, it's like, I, at the end of the day, I have to be true to what I believe scripture says. And I fear God more than I fear man. Right. Right, and so that's yeah. where it gets down to that. When I make the decision, it's like, no, I do this because I fear God. Um, and now, there's my explanation. You brought up something I really want to hear you finish off on. So you talked about how we know this uh, on a base level, but then how you amplify that. Right, right. Tell us, tell me what you're. You're thinking. right. A lot of times we look at the situation that's directly in front of us. Yeah. But asking the deeper question, both from a theological and philosophical uh, level. Why does the Christian care so much about so this? So much, yeah. And really what you see here at play here are two competing worldviews. Yeah. One worldview views mankind essentially as a cosmic accident, you yeah. know, a highly formed uh, animal. Right. And so in reality, the value of human life in that economy, if you will, is very low. Where the Christian comes to his, uh, his or her perspective is this. We believe that God created us in, and this is an ancient word in the Christian faith, in the imago dei, yep. in the image of God. And we find that all the way back at the beginning, right. that we are created in the image of God. And what you see in that worldview is God dearly cares for human life, that it is of grave consequence yep. when a human life is taken. And so when you when you think about those and we're, I'm trying to reduce it to the basest of levels. When you look at those worldviews, one sees human life as of high value because of the Imago Dei. Yep. The other one sees human life as of some value, but certainly not of high, as high a value. And, and that's because we are essentially in their economy that we're cosmic accidents that were right. evolved in certain ways. Right. And so that's the reason why when we sometimes talk about these things, we're actually talking two different languages. Hmm. We, we hold so true. Uh, mankind as of high value 
But the value that we hold all the way back to conception is something that might be an absurdity to someone who thinks of us as just simply being cosmic accidents. Right. At the end of the day, you have two competing worldviews or religious philosophies mm -hmm. at play here. Right. And I think that's the reason why this conversation is taken 48 years for us to flesh this out. One of the things that amps me, so mm -hmm. as a pastor, if I, if I ever do this, okay, yeah. what amps me is... And I, and I mentioned this already, but it's a fear of God. And I think this is the thing that I pound the fist on the table, not at, not at the, the natural man mm -hmm. that doesn't discern or understand the things of God. That, right. Honestly, that person doesn't anger me, in, or I say anger, it doesn't agitate me as much as the person that does claims to have life in Christ, mm -hmm. and then, then they... They press down the importance, or it's like they poo poo. It's like, oh, yeah. maybe they're pro uh, choice for whatever, lots of other reasons. And I get that. And we'll talk yeah. about that in a second if we have time. But what amps me is like, yeah, but do you realize all throughout scripture, this whole book is filled of stories of God removing his favor, removing right. his hand. Right. You, you remember that story? I think it's in Ezekiel, you know, the, the flame or the spirit of God left the the Holy of Holies, yes, and then went on to the outer wall of the temple, and then it, and then it went to the outer wall of the city, and you and can see it progressively leaving, leaving, and that that picture to me is what we've done. We've you know let's go back to prayer in public schools or prayer and you know whatever we've pushed God out of yeah. everything in our lives, and so and then when it you know this was kind of what, what did you say forty years ago, uh, forty eight, forty eight years ago, I believe seventy three to now, yeah, and so. You know, we've been pushing God, pushing God, and pushing God. And this is this is one of those key issues for the Christian. If if a if a non-Christian is listening to this and say, Why do you care so much? Here's why. Mm -hmm. It's not because we think we have some kind of smarter mind than a science. I'm not it's not that at all. Right. It's all about God's favor. Exactly. And trying to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And if God says these this life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. And then, and that's the Imago Day. We are made in His image, right. and we are image bearers, and we matter to God. It's like, okay, if they matters to God, this it matters to us, right? And we have to try to. So that's where they where we get amped. I think, right? And this is just my opinion. It's like, well, we get amped about these things because I think God's, and we don't want to push God out of these things. Yeah, and we have for years. Then I think one of the ways in which that has been proven is where abortion began to really become question is when people finally could see ultrasounds oh, because yeah. what you can see in the oh, womb is true. that's a little human being. That's true. And I think one of the other fundamental Christian aspects of this in this conversation is that the Christian is called to be a voice for the voiceless. And so when you can see quite literally that children are responding to pain in the womb as people are doing heinous crimes, we, uh, it was just a few years ago that, uh, that, Gosnell, I forget his first name, that abortionist um, who had oh, yeah. buried tons of baby, done a lot of different things that were absolutely wrong and for which he will spend uh, the rest of his life in jail. Hmm. I think what people saw across the country was that's wrong. Yeah, That was the murdering of children, yeah. some of them outside of the womb. And so I think people in their heart of hearts can now see these are little babies that are voiceless. Right. And someone needs to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves exactly. yet. Exactly. That's exactly. a fundamental Christian desire. Right. That is not necessarily a desire that comes from uh, a, a pagan influence. If you go back to ancient Rome, and I, I forget the philosopher who was pointing this out a number of years ago. If you go back to ancient Rome, they really didn't care. They enslaved a lot of people and treated people as cattle mm -hmm. uh, in that kind of slavery. Christianity has systematically destroyed, by the way, slavery... We did have see a rise of serfdom in Western Europe, but serfdom was different than abject slavery. And not only that, in this country, when chattel slavery came back up again, Christians rose up in absolute opposition to that. Right. And eventually you saw the blood of hundreds of thousands of young men that was shed all over the eastern seaboard of this country right. to eradicate slavery. That, and so that's why the Christian cares. They speak as a voice for the voiceless. You... Um you brought this up because uh, you went to see David Barton and you were telling oh, me about yeah. a dark document that I just think. Oh, Can yeah. you share that story? Yes, absolutely. So this was new to me. Um, he was talking about this new uh, neo-Marxist kind of um, um, uh, race Marxism is how it was phrased. 
And I appreciated it. One of the things they brought out was uh, there are some people that will say that the Declaration of Independence and the entire formation of this country was just to perpetuate violence, uh, races, racial violence. Okay. That was absolutely proven false. It was amazing how he did this in this uh, program. But I saw, so in 1823, they were actually able to get into Monticello and look through Thomas Jefferson's books and and a lot of the different stuff that he had stored in files and everything else. One of the things they found was the original draft of the Declaration of Independence. Unbelievable. In that original draft, there's a lot of changes. And what you'll see is that this was stricken and it'll have actually the initials of the guy who said we should strike that. No kidding. And, and, or wow. we should change it here and all that. It was intriguing. Was there well, a lot of changes through throughout the whole There document? were a number. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Like written in different ink or same ink? No, same just, ink. Just but do with, this. Yeah, they would actually initial. This uh, is the guy who proposed this. Okay. Uh, so because there were five midi, men on the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Okay. But one of the things that was stricken, and the, it was heavily debated, but it was stricken for a reason, where you'll go through and they list all of these grievances against the King yep, of England right. as to why they must declare their independence. Right. Most of them are one or two lines long at the most. Most are just one line. You'll get to one, though. It stands out on the page because it's so long. It's about five or six lines. It's an entire paragraph. Hmm. And not only that, you'll notice in the middle of it, there is a, a word that is in all caps. It's the only time it occurs in the document through the body of the document. I think hmm. at the beginning it does. It, it does all caps. But one of the things is that, that particular grievance Thomas Jefferson, mind you, a man who owned slaves, he said to the king of England, we must separate you from you because you have perpetuated a violence against all caps men. By that he meant mankind. Wow. And what he's talking about that, that particular violence that was perpetuated by the king of England was you are forcing men to be enslaved. You're bringing them to our shores and then you are forcing us basically to keep them enslaved. Wow. That's very powerful. He's saying we need to separate from England because we need to do away with slavery. And he even says these are fellow men is what he's getting at with those all caps. Now, that absolutely defies the Everything ideas. Everything we've heard. Yeah, of the race Marxists like uh, oh Ibram X. Gosh. Kendi. Yeah. It, 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 you look at the actual documents from history, and it absolutely contradicts the narrative that the, uh, the modern Marxist is pushing Right. On the American public, right? Well, that that is that is transformational in our society. Yeah. If if that could be, if that news can get out there and people oh, yeah. understand, because every, yeah. everyone's trying to to you know to erase or to rewrite history or or to cancel everything, yeah. and that's our you know they're trying to cancel yeah, yeah. just literally everything. If they could cancel the uh, founders, you, they would, I think. One of the things, can I just toss this in here? One of the things right next to that document that they that they had at this museum was actually a piece of the collar from the coat Abraham Lincoln was wearing the night he was shot. Oh, my gosh. And you actually see his blood. Oh but part of the gosh. reason why I, I felt like as I was looking at those two oh things together, gosh. they didn't provide a narrative, but I was looking at that. Oh. There are people, hundreds of thousands of people, that died to eradicate slavery. Right. And when we talk about it, I don't know if you know this. I, I did some research a while back. 1688, the very first abolitionist movement in the world was in Pennsylvania, and it was an abolitionist movement in the United, uh, in the colonies in America. Mm. Wow. Now, that was well before any of this was being uh, talked about in England. When we look at um, all the northern states, they absolutely rejected slavery. They thought slavery was a crime against man. Right. It was, again, they recognized that the people that were being enslaved were created in the Imago Dei, yep. in the image of God. And how can you do that? Well, and, and so, that's, that is a strong... You talk about... We've talked about the Great Awakenings. We, you know, the strength of the um, the Word of God in that particular mm -hmm. time, especially up in that northern area, right. you know, New York, Pennsylvania, to think that that's where the, the mindset came from and the all the impetus to separate from right. England. Now, hold that thought because... I think I can hear people saying, well, so why did it take so long, you know, mm -hmm. uh, till we had, you know, 180 years later, or whatever, mm -hmm. about 100 years later, we had the Civil War. Right. And yeah. uh, so why why didn't it, 
the the Revolutionary War in slavery. Right. Well, and that that's one of the 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 challenges. When you step back to 1776, slavery was still going on very strong in England. Mm. The world didn't understand as we do today um, just the depravity of slavery. Mm. And there were people on the American continent that began to bring this up. And so in 1776, with the Declaration, you have Thomas Jefferson and other people pointing out this is an evil right. that must end. They were saying some of these things for the first time. Mm. And so secondly, from 1776 um, um, uh, to 1804, all of the northern states either gradually or immediately eradicated slavery. Okay. That's, by the way, something you don't find everywhere else. Oh, I didn't in know 1804, that. England hadn't yet eradicated slavery. Right. The American colonists, and actually then this young fledgling nation, was breaking new ground by saying slavery is wrong. Okay. Even, even the southern states, during the war for independence, began to speak against slavery. Sadly, South Carolina, and I know I'm picking on South Carolina, they reversed their idea early on. Hmm. Secondly, they, in 1804, the Constitution itself called for an end to slavery, and South Carolina def began to defy the Constitution, as did a lot of other southern states. Oh, wow. And so because you, of slavery. Because of slavery. Wow. So while we, they were breaking new ground, there were still people that were resistant, but the, the course was already set in America. Hmm. While some people began to get stronger, other people, the abolitionists, began to say, no, this is a crime against humanity, eventually to actually eradicate it from our soil, it took the death, uh, it, the bloodiest war in yeah, American history to true. this day. So I've also heard that the reason that they didn't, uh, you know, the document, or maybe maybe the reason they struck that, I don't know, it, out of the Declaration of Independence, is because we had to have the southern states right. on board. Is that, and is it that was South Carolina statement? specifically that, that was right? objecting the most. And if yeah. we didn't have the South on board, then there's no way we could separate from... It's right. almost like, okay, we got to deal with England and, the, and King George, right? Right, and then, right. Then we'll deal with this later, but it was on their right. hearts and their minds to do right. so. I listened to an interview of a, a professor, I think, from Cornell, but I may be wrong on that, uh, not too long ago. And one of the things he was pointing out was for them to even have an opportunity to start standing up for the ensla for enslaved races. They had to first fight a war with England. Yeah. They all felt that. So they felt like, okay, not only that, uh, uh, George Washington and a couple others believed that slavery would die a natural death. Oh, for instance, Washington was pointing out that many slaves in the South, because they were beginning to replace tobacco, tobacco had leached a lot of nutrients out of the oil, uh, soil, so they began to essentially loan out slaves, lease them to other people, and they began to recognize, well, wait a second. Now we're showing that these are not these are not cattle, the way some people talk about them. This is wrong. And so we he believed and others believed that this is going to die out because people see that this is our fellow man. Right. And so they felt like, I think, at the time, that was this is the thesis of this one gentleman. They felt like slavery would die its own natural death. What they couldn't have foreseen was what would happen with the Civil War. Hmm. And uh, that's where people would begin to double down. And, and not only that, then the cotton gin and a replacement of a crop where people begin to um, perpetuate something that was very evil and vile. Hmm. And so anyway, they felt like they had to fight England first yep. to establish that humanity should be free. Yep. And then secondly, develop... How do we get rid of slavery? Yeah. Wow. So, does does David Barton have a? Is there a museum or what? What did you go down when? Well, you yeah, down there? he has a lot of those kind of things, uh, and uh, uh, we we saw some of those at a uh, at a different place there. But anyway, it was a very it was a great trip, and and after that, uh, then I, I got imagine. to go spend some time with family and tour the USS Enterprise in yep. San Diego, an yep. aircraft carrier and stuff. But well, that's where yeah, that's where good. I want to go next because the last oh. time I talked to you, you were you were on vacation right. and we we had a discussion about wit and wisdom. So oh, we'll yes. we'll roll into that one the next uh, next podcast and just keep you around here uh, today and uh, keep talking about that. So Sounds good. well, in the meantime, uh, we are always challenging to each of you, from all of us to each of you, to be strong and very courageous. God bless you.